Asha uh, as a review speaker for this evening. She will speak on supporting equity and inclusion in STEM. I'm not reading out the abstract, uh, which I'm sure most of you have read it. I'll just read out uh, her bi bi biography. Louise uh, is, uh, is the Karl Mannheim uh, Professor of Sociology of Education at UCL, UK. Her research focuses on educational identities and inequalities, particularly in relation to participation in STEM across primary, secondary, and higher education, and in informal STEM learning settings. She has directed numerous large research studies focused on understanding inequalities in STEM participation, and has authored over 100 articles, books, and chapters. She is particularly interested in co-design uh, work with teachers and educational practices, and was awarded prizes for the impact of her work in 2019 and 2020. Uh, so um, Louis will uh, address us for 45 minutes, then we will take questions from you. Looking forward to a very active session. Thank Louis. you. Thank you very much, Shishri, that's very kind. So I'm just trying to share my screen. So hopefully that will work. Uh, there we go. Fantastic. Right, so yes, uh, it's a pleasure to come and talk about our research with you. Um, and as you can see from the title, we're particularly interested in these ideas of how do we support equity and inclusion in STEM. So as I'm sure you all know, we're working in this policy context where there's a lot of concern about um, the rates of participation. So are enough young people studying STEM and for long enough? And is, are they diverse enough as well? So particularly in contexts like ours in the UK. So we've had a lot of time and resource invested in trying to solve this problem over time. I'd say particularly in the UK, we've there have been gains, but overall not massive changes in our participation rates. And when we look at who studies STEM in the UK, it's still very narrow, very privileged, um, particularly in subjects like physics and engineering. Um, and this is repeated in a number of other international contexts as well. Like everywhere, we've seen that existing inequalities have been exacerbated and made worse by the COVID pandemic. So when we've looked at the sorts of interventions that we see in schools and out of school settings, we see that a lot of the work um, that gets done tends to focus on trying to make science or STEM more fun or more interesting with the idea that if young people are just more interested in it, surely they'll just go on and study it more. But our research suggests that a lack of interest is not the main problem. So I'm gonna talk a bit about our Aspires research. So since 2009, our Aspires project has tracked a cohort of young people from age 10 in primary school up to age 23. So currently this year, our cohort are about age 22. So it's a mixed method study. We do large scale surveys. So we've surveyed over 48,000 young people so far as part of this. And we also do in-depth longitudinal interviews. So we've got 50 young people and their parents who we've um, managed to keep in the study and interview every couple of years from age 10 to 22. So we've conducted uh, hundreds, right, you can see around 800 interviews there. So we've, this together gives us hopefully this nice picture of breadth and depth to try and understand what is it that makes a difference to a young person's trajectory? What makes one young person go into STEM or science and not another? So you can just see a little breakdown there of the different phases. So from um, phase one and with age 10, 11 is year six in our, in our system, which is the last year of primary. You can see that we pick them up through secondary and then out uh, the other side. And the most recent phase was when many of them were in higher education, but a lot had also gone into jobs, um, some had become parents and, and so on. So when we look at our survey data, we get this picture where most young people actually report liking science, but this doesn't translate into them seeing it as something that they could be in the future. So for example, getting a, a job in science or being a scientist. So just looking at some of our 
example survey items, we see here that um, on the whole, most young people were telling us that they learn, for example, interesting things in science. So this first um, set of bars here, so this first uh, blue one, age 10, over 70% are saying they are learning interesting things in science at school. Uh, it's still quite high in early secondary with the red one here. And even the purple one, <clears throat> which in England is age 15, 16, which is our big national exams year, and to be honest, it's really hard to keep anything interesting at that time because it's very much teaching for the exams. Even then, nearly 60% of young people are saying they're finding science at school interesting. This uh, grayed out bar here, the last one, um, is just those students who choose to continue with science when it's no longer compulsory. So unsurprisingly, that is nice and high. But overall, we're seeing there's something that teachers are doing right because science is, you know, it's interesting for most of the young people. It's not that they're finding it boring. This second group of bars here is exemplifying um, parental and family uh, valuing of science. So we wondered, you know, may maybe their families don't think it's important for them to learn science. But actually, these bars are telling us that the vast majority are saying that their parents think it's really important for them to learn science. So you can see here over 70%, apart from when science is no longer compulsory and it drops off quite sharply. So there are discussions uh, in, in England at the moment around, should we continue with our current system? We have a very specialised system. We get children to specialise very early at school. Um, and so there are debates around, you know, maybe we should get more children to continue with more subjects for longer, but I'd be really interested to hear what's, what's uh, usual in, in the, uh, the Indian system as well. It's also not that the majority of young people had really negative views of scientists. So again, here, this third set of columns, we can see that it's over 70%, I mean, um, really high of young people saying, you know, for example, agreeing that scientists do valuable work. Many of them also thought that scientists earn a lot of money, which is not something that all scientists agree with, but again, this sort of a general picture of positive uh, perceptions. So all of these positive views, we thought, might translate into lots of young people thinking they want to continue with science in the future. But actually, we can see here down the bottom, this last set of columns shows that all these positive views don't necessarily translate into that. So this last set here um, seems to vary a little bit in the numbers, but statistically, they're, it's the same. So statistically, there's no difference in the proportion of young people agreeing at age 10 that they'd like to be a scientist compared to the proportion at age 17, 18. And we call this the being doing divide. Like, yeah, the children seem to like doing science. They just don't see it as something they can want to be in the future. So we're interested in what creates this, this gap between the two. And we were also interested to see that when we looked at the profile of who was agreeing that they'd like to be a scientist, Although we could see some kind of gendered patterns, for example, at the start, these got more pronounced over time. So over time, the proportion who were saying they'd like to be a scientist was more likely to become um, more affluent boys, um, for, for example. So interested in what is it that's giving these messages and creating these patterns. So just to put those aspirations for wanting to be a scientist in context, we, this is just from age 15, 16 students, but their pattern is very similar at most of the ages. So we can see the most popular aspiration here is for business and scientist is right down over the end here. Slightly depressingly, celebrity is here, bar four. So we're interested in, in what, what makes scientists feel less attractive than, for example, business. Now, in one sense, we do have to take this with a, a little bit of caution because business can mean lots and lots of very different things. It can mean being the, the boss of a huge international company. It could mean having your own very small little local business. But we were interested because also when we look at the profile of who's aspiring to these different areas, as I said, those aspiring to science and particularly to engineering, were particularly engineering was overwhelmingly uh, 
students, uh, male students. Whereas when we look at business, it was the most mixed. It was the most um, gender, ethnic and social class balanced. So there is something about business that feels open, that feels that young people can imagine themselves into it in a way that many can't or don't feel that with science, despite finding it interesting. So when we looked across all of our qualitative and quantitative data, we mapped out some of the key factors that we found were influencing these patterns of aspiration and participation, what, what young people ended up going into. And this slightly ugly diagram really tells us it is complex. There is no one thing. We found all of these different factors that were interrelated all made a difference, all combined together to affect this, uh, the, the, the science identity and aspiration of a young person. So the likelihood that a young person would feel, yes, science is for me, it's something I want to go into in the future. So I'm gonna talk through um, some of these, these areas, um, but just to, to flag that they do all interconnect. And there's a link to our report that sets it all out in more detail if you're interested. So the first area, the kind of bluey colour, were factors related to what we call capital. So we use the idea in the project of science capital. And really, this is just a concept, a way of holding together all the different forms of science related resource um, that, you, that you have in your life. And we found that the more a young person's science capital is valued, in their, particularly in their educational setting, the more likely they are to aspire to and to participate in science after the age of 16 and to have a science identity. So by that we mean to see themselves and to be seen by others as a sciencey person. So schools and other educational settings made a big difference to what and whether a young person's science capital got recognised and then leveraged and valued support to support their science trajectory or not. So when you, when you think about science capital, we, we sometimes use the analogy of the bag or the holdall, as you can see from the little picture, uh, with the idea that it contains all your science related stuff that you have. And if you use the bag image, you can think of science capital comprising four main areas or pockets, if you work with the bag metaphor. So the first, statistically, when we, we map them out, the first area is a person's science literacy. So what you know. So their sort of science knowledge and understanding and so on. The second area is their science related attitudes and values. So how they think about science. So do you see science as everywhere in the world? Do you see it as relevant to your life and so on? The third area uh, is about out of school science behaviours. So basically what, what young people do in their spare time. So do they look at science websites? Do they read science magazines or books? Go to a science centre, talk with someone at home about science and so on. And the fourth area, science at home, is who they know out of school particularly. So is there someone at home who talks to them about science, who encourages them to do it, who maybe has science qualifications or a background or a job in science themselves? And unsurprisingly, the more you have of these forms of capital, statistically, the more likely you are to go into uh, science in the future. And, and we also did some analyses um, to look at whether science relates to um, STEM as well. And we found that science capital is particularly strongly value, uh, um, predictive of participation in physics, uh, but also engineering. It's related to maths and computing, but not, not quite as strong. So when we talk about science capital, um, we're really using the phrase in a sociological way. We particularly draw on the work of Pierre Bourdieu, uh, who was, was a French sociologist, a picture there, and his ideas of habitus, capital and field. Now, Bourdieu wasn't really interested in science particularly, he was more interested in the arts and so on, but his ideas, I think, have relevance. And so we've tried to bring them across, borrow them and use them. So Bourdieu proposed that uh, you can understand these kind of um, 
patterns of reproduction in social life through the interaction of what he calls habitus, capital and field. So for Bourdieu, habitus refers to socialized embodied dispositions that shape whether science uh, feels for me or not. Um, these are gendered, classed, racialized and so on. It gives you what's called a feel for the game, that kind of internal sense of what's normal for people like me. This interacts with capital, which can be take different forms. So they're cultural capital, social capital, economic, symbolic, and so on. And these are the resources that you have and accrue, uh, a bit like the hand that you might have to play in the, in the game. And all of this takes place within the context of the field. The field is more than just context. I find it a really useful concept because it really brings in notions of power. Bourdieu talks about a field as a space of positions and position taking, and it sets the rules of the game. So we can think of the field at different scales. There can be the field of education, the field of science, but there can also be the field of the science classroom. So what gets valued, who gets valued, and that can make a real difference to someone's habitus and capital. So Bourdieu says it's the extent of the fit between your habitus, capital and the field that you're in that shapes whether or not you feel that a particular um, thing, in, this, in our case, science is for you or not, whether you experience that field like he calls a fish in water, whether it feels easy or whether you feel the weight of the water on you. So we were interested in how particular families, uh, different forms of science capital made young people feel more that science is for me or not, and it produced these different trajectories. So just to give you a little sense from some of our qualitative data, the top two quotes are from families with, let's say, very high levels of, of science capital. So there's a mum there saying, well, talking about how the other day in the car, we were laughing about chemical symbols and things. So I guess it comes into our discussions quite subliminally, really. Now, many of you may regularly laugh about chemical symbols in the car or wherever you happen to be with other people. But in our study, this wasn't that common. It was really among these very, very sciencey families. And you'll be unsurprised to know that that mother has a background in chemistry. She has a chemistry degree and works in a chemistry related job. The second quote is from a young woman called Davina. And she said, well, science is just where it's at in my family. And she talked about how her and her family members would sit around the dining table wearing their science T-shirts, talking about, about what they've read in science magazines like New Scientist and so on. So for these families, science wasn't just a school subject that you do. It was part of who we are, part of the identity, part of the fabric of daily family life. And unsurprisingly, the mother uh, who gives a quote there, her daughter has gone into a STEM related area and Davina is just finishing off the last year of a chemistry uh, degree. But they were the minority. They were generally about 5% of uh, families in our sample um, have these sort of high levels of science capital. More common were the quotes, the, the bottom two quotes. So the mum saying, hmm, well, I suppose in everyday life, you just don't get that much to do with science. So for this mother, like many uh, of the young people and families in the study, Science felt distant, it felt alien, it, it wasn't this part of the everyday life and identity and family fabric, it felt abstract and distant from them, they, they didn't see it, whereas the science families would just literally see science everywhere, in the echoes of your voice, in the electricity powering your computer, everything. And as Jack, the quote there says, you know, his family, he said, no, they never talk about science. So, as I said, science capital, um, the more, like the, the two families uh, that in the first two quotes, these high levels of science capital, the young people from those families were statistically more likely to aspire to and progress into um, STEM after the age of 16. So you can see there from our longitudinal sample, 80% of those who never aspired to STEM or science had low science capital, 83% of those who carried on after the age of 18 had a very high uh, science capital. And as I said, it's a reasonable proxy for STEM capital. And we can see that particularly with physics, where you're nearly eight times more likely uh, to go into physics if you have high science capital and just over three times more likely in engineering. 
So that, thinking back to that diagram, that's the sort of first bluey bucket. We then have um, this kind of, these kind of greeny areas uh, at the bottom, which are about representations of science and STEM. And particularly uh, in our research, it's representations of these as clever and as aligned with masculinity. <clears throat> so over time, young people had this pervasive reinforcement of that if you study science or STEM, it's really hard and it's only for really clever people. As we've written out about before, notions of cleverness we see as highly gendered, classed and racialized. So they're very much aligned with white middle class masculinity as uh, epitomized there by the character Sheldon, uh, the physicist from the Big Bang Theory, the American uh, comedy series. And even when other students attain highly, if they're not fitting the ideals of white middle class masculine cleverness, they can sometimes feel inauthentic or don't get recognized as authentic STEM people or science people and so on. So we were interested how these ideas emerge and develop over time. And there's just some quotes here from Victor, who's one of the young men in our study. He's actually just uh, last year finished uh, an astrophysics degree, but we've chosen him just because he said quite similar things to other people, but you can see the examples particularly clearly over time. So when we talked to him at age 10 in year six, he, like many other children, expressed this lovely view of you don't have to be clever to do science. You just have to really like it or try your best or be really interested. So sort of nice, open, meritocratic ideals. By the time he got to year eight in early secondary, he was saying, well, I think you have to be a little bit clever. You probably have to be quite clever. By year nine, you can see that solidifying more. So people who are keen on science, they're not average people, they're cleverer than most people. And by age 16, year 11, yes, you need to be clever to study science. So you can see he, he, the children aren't born thinking that science is associated with cleverness and masculinity. They learn it, we teach them this over time. And you can see that these views um, progress and solidify Despite him, he changes school, he goes from primary to secondary, he has different teachers each year, he studies different curricula, but all the messages that he and the others are getting are that science is associated with cleverness. And so he comes to learn it, and by the age of 16, it's what Bourdieu would call a sort of dox, so a, a thing that you just take for granted, you don't even question it, that's just the way the world is. So those ideas exclude many young people who don't feel or don't get recognized as living up to them uh, from science. And the third area, the purpley ones, are about the educational factors and practices that made a difference. So in our study in England, we found that most of the young people uh, had quite patchy and patterned careers education. Arguably, those who could have benefited most from it received the least um, and the poorest quality. Those students who are the most privileged in our sample received the most extensive and holistic forms of, of career support. We also found uh, strong uh, effects of the ways that in England, we really try very hard to stop a lot of young people from continuing in science. We set up all these hurdles and these structures and systems which are really unhelpful. So for example, from about the age of 13, 14, young people in England tend to get divided onto what's called either a double science route, route or the prestigious triple science route. So the triple science route is seen as the main route for people who would continue with science after the age of 16. But it's not offered equally and it's not offered wide but fairly. So in some schools, if you're in a more affluent school, you may have the option for everyone to study it, but that's quite rare. Uh, rather, often what happens in many schools is only the top attaining 30 children or so might get to study it. And in some schools, uh, we found that it's not offered at all. So, or some schools, children who take it have to do it as an after school additional class. So it's not an even chance of whether you it can, can pursue um, a science route going forward. 
There's also an educative impact because for some reason in, in England, we mark at A level at advanced level age 18 exams, um, we mark physics and chemistry harder than other subjects, which means it's harder to get a top grade, which means in turn schools restrict the entry of students onto those A levels. And these practices in turn reinforce what we were talking about in the previous slide, the idea of science is only for the clever, which then makes lots of children feel that, well, I don't live up to that. I'm not a genius, so it can't possibly be for me. So our concern here is that even if we made every child in the UK want to study science, we actually don't let the majority of them onto these routes that would make it easier for them to progress with it. We also found a depressing number of examples of ways in which these ideas get reproduced by teachers. So we were aware that young people were finding, learning from their teachers that getting these ideas that um, science, but particularly physics is only for the select male brainy few. We talk about these in one of our papers as a sort of cultivation of these ideas of who continues with science and, the, and particularly physics and the weeding out of those who don't live up to it. So young people in our study told us about how their teachers would often reinforce the idea that this subject is difficult. So science teachers might be more likely to say, oh, this is a difficult subject. You might, have, you might struggle to understand it more so than in other non-science subjects. Young women also told us that their teachers said things like, well, you need a boy brain to study maths or physics, or all my girls who take A-level physics are tomboys, so sort of um, more, more, do more masculine performances of identity. And this was even told to us by girls attending very prestigious uh, science-focused girls' schools. So it, it was common, more common than we were expecting. We also found that boys and students with high cultural capital were the most likely to say that they received encouragement from their teachers to continue as science. So we think there are these forms of unconscious bias coming through. And over time, these forms of what Bourdieu would call pedagogic work produce this narrow range of future scientists who, who reproduce, who are more likely to, to continue with these sort of stereotypes and, and ideas. And this was especially so in physics. So when we looked, when we surveyed the sample at age uh, 17, 18, and we looked at who were the students who were statistically the most likely to agree with statements such as scientists are odd, male or geeky, it was our A-level physics students. So we see this as the way that physics cultivates this idea of, uh, of that you have to be this sort of male genius to study the subject. Other students who feel they don't live up to it get weeded out. And the, the problem then is that if the students who are most likely to think these sort of stereotypical ideas are the physicists, physics students, they, some of them will presumably be the physics teachers of the future who may keep reinforcing these patterns. So there was a sort of irony in a way we found in some of the interventions in the UK where a lot of effort is put in trying to convince non-science students that anyone can do science, that you don't have to be odd male and geeky. But our data was suggesting those other students aren't the ones who have the strongest stereotypes of that area. It's the physics students who are most likely to agree with that. So maybe the intervention work needs to happen more with them. So as I said, the analysis of the data showed that the physics students were statistically distinctive, both compared to other A-level science students and compared to students in general. So they had this higher maths and science self-confidence. They were generally more pro-science in their views. And as I said, they were much more likely to agree that scientists are odd, male and geeky. Beyond this sort of um, notion of the physics habitus, we also notice it is specifically gendered. So when we looked at the interview data, young men taking physics were much more likely to talk about themselves as being strong or good at the subject or quite good or talking about how they'd find it easy. And those who didn't continue with physics would tend to give external reasons for, for why they, they wouldn't continue with it. So it's because they like something else more or the teaching's no good or whatever. 
the young women who took physics A level at age 17, 18, had to negotiate their femininity in relation to this idea of the of physics being a masculine area. So they often felt that if they were putting in a lot of time and effort, that somehow that meant that they weren't clever enough, that they weren't being effortlessly clever. So they'd often talk about finding physics too hard and feeling that that must mean it's not for me. We only had one young woman in the interview sample who actually continued on to a physics degree, and that was Hannah, who I'll come back to in a moment. But the majority of girls who liked physics found that there were these other things stopping them from feeling it could be for them. So that, there was a lot of self-exclusion. So, for example, Kate took advanced level physics uh, at age 18. And when I interviewed her about what she was going to choose at university, she said, well, I think I've always liked physics, but always thought it was quite hard. So maybe not for me. So I wouldn't do a straight physics degree because it would be too hard. So I think I'm just a bit put off thinking it'd be really hard. So you can see uh, very subtly there that maybe Kate thinks physics is a bit too hard. But when we look at Kate's attainment, Kate was the highest achieving student in our sample. She got the top grades, which were A stars across the board, including in physics. So she absolutely did have the attainment to do a physics degree. But you can see she feels it's not, some, not for her. She ends up going on to do a natural sciences degree and was considering taking a physics module on the degree, but the tutor at the start dissuaded her from this and told her it will be too hard. In the end, Kate's gone on and has specialised in plant science and is very happy in plant science. But you can see that it's not her attainment here, it's these messages the whole time that, you know, if not feeling clever enough, and that impacts differentially beyond attainment on different students. So as I said, we did have one young woman who went on to study physics. How did she do that? Well, she had similar attainment to many of the other young women in the sample who also took advanced level physics, but who didn't continue with it at university. She had good attainment, but it wasn't different uh, from any of the others. Uh, she also experienced being the only girl in her physics class at A-level. She didn't have views of physics that were different from anyone else. So as she says there, you know, I guess physics has that connotation of manliness. So she had to manage that. But what she did have was a very physics related habitus and capital. So she was very interested in science. She was also um, the way she performed her gender identity. She's often talking about being proud to be different or the quote there says, I like surprising people. I like breaking boundaries. So she saw taking physics as a way of doing this and celebrating that, of her celebrating her difference. She managed her femininity, her appearance, and her uh, and intellectually as well. And she also, which did set her apart from the other young women in the study, she had exceptionally high physics-related capital. So she had direct family members who were physicists. And particularly her brother was a physicist, and he was also married to uh, her sister-in-law, who was also a woman physicist. And so she had lots of of uh, physics capital. So Hannah said she would like to feel that she's good at physics. So even with all of this and being a physicist, she still has these little slight questions that I'd like to feel, not I am good at physics. Um, and she worries that she's maybe not authentic as a student because she doesn't breeze through. So that idea that the ideal physics student is effortlessly clever. And that is coming back to that idea of the, the, the male um, science genius. We also looked at social class in our study. As I said, we have these different routes and we found that the different routes uh, that students take were very much classed in terms of who took them. And we found that students who are from working class backgrounds often struggled to be recognised as good physics students, even if they were attaining fine. So Danielle in our study is a white working class girl. She describes herself as, as very glamorous. She has wonderful hair, extensions, nail and makeup and so on. And she constantly talks about how she feels she's not seen as a proper physics student. So she talks about how when she went to a science fair where you learn about different careers, she was heading towards the science stand and a woman came careering across the hall to her and said, you look like you'd like to do beauty, young lady. She comes from a family who've never been to university. Uh, she talks about how all my family is not clever. No one's been there. So for her, she has a lot 
of things which combine to make her feel inauthentic. And she ends up um, not taking physics uh, at advanced level and she ends up going off to study sociology, which for me is a win. Um, so when we look at the working class students in our sample who did become socially mobile, who attained higher levels of education than their parents, we found that what we call a wraparound of resources and capital was important over time across different contexts. And also they had luck. They had lucky access to particular forms of social and educational capital, which while useful for them is also slightly depressing uh, as a policy message of how do we design for luck? In terms of race and ethnicity in our study, we found that black students had higher science aspirations and family support than white students, but this did not translate into participation. So this for us is about challenging um, common education policy narratives in the UK, which often assume that the reason black students aren't in science at higher levels is because they lack aspiration. Our data says it's not that at all. We see it as the role of racism and the intersection with class. We found that minoritized, racially minoritized students in our sample often took more backdoor routes uh, to get to where they wanted to with science degrees. Um, and we also have a chapter written on uh, an example of a case study of Vanessa, who's a young woman of a black African background, who had a strong family support and valuing of science. And she had a love of science. She really liked it, wanted to go into it, but over time, this was eroded by her experiences through the education system. And at the end, as her and her father reflected at, um, when they were older, um, her love for it wasn't enough. It, having an interest alone wasn't enough. It was all these other things that stopped her. So the result, we would say, um, is the systematic exclusion of students from science. So it wasn't that young people necessarily lacked interest or aspiration, but we have all of these different factors from societal discourses to educational gatekeeping to home and family factors that all combine together to make it really difficult for young people to continue. And which mean that those who do continue in these particular pathways become cultivated in such a way that they're more likely to keep reproducing those inequalities in the future rather than challenge them. So things stay the same. So there's often uh, an idea that uh, a metaphor used of the science pipeline, the idea that you know, people leak out of the pipeline at each stage. We would challenge this. Our data say it would suggest that young people don't passively leak out of the pipeline. They're formally and informally ejected through a range of injustices, more like a rigged bingo machine. So this is a, a clip from the US uh, drama series, Better Call Saul. And in it, it, Saul has a rigged bingo machine. So he has a, a mechanism worked up, which means that he knows which ball will come out. We say this is a bit more like the science uh, process. There's a strong power of what Bourdieu calls symbolic violence, where the people who are most disadvantaged by this come to blame themselves. So I'm not clever enough or so on. And we'd say it's not random. It's socially patterned and it's self-reproducing. So what can be done? We suggest that rather than trying to change young people, we need to change the structural and the systemic barriers that prevent even these highly interested and well attaining young people from continuing. This for us means rethinking common deficit and individualized discourses, and it means we're trying to change the field. So trying to change science education pedagogy, changing our business as usual, not the young people. I'm just gonna briefly show you two tools that we've co-developed with teachers that can help with this in case you're interested in trying them out yourself. So one is called the Equity Compass and it helps support a social justice mindset. And the other is the science capital teaching approach. So the Equity Compass is a reflective tool. Um, you can use it. We've worked out versions with teachers, with senior school leaders and governors, with um, science outreach practitioners, STEM ambassadors, uh, all sorts of different versions. But basically, it helps orientate you to take a social justice approach in your practice or policy. Thank you, Josh. Um, thank you. So it helps you think about how equitable your practice is. There are sets of reflective questions with each of the dimensions. There are four general areas and then eight sub dimensions. And you can plot your progress. So near the centre is less equitable. 
moving outwards is where we want to go. So it helps you see progress if you're moving in the right direction. We've also got a handbook. We've got primary and secondary versions. This is just the primary one for a teaching approach that was co-developed with teachers, which is about how we put all of these ideas into practice. And you can see we also have, uh, we've got a Hindi translation. We've got um, uh, other languages as well. So again, based on these ideas of how do we change our practice to challenge all of these uh, issues that are um, stopping young people from connecting with science and feeling that it's for me. So just a couple ideas. If you're interested, you can apply the equity lens to your work. If you want to choose the equity compass, if you do ambassador and outreach work, we've also got a free short self-paced MOOC. Um, that you can learn how to use it. It's uh, not too many hours, a few hours, uh, but there's a link there. And if you're a teacher or work with teachers, maybe the ideas in the handbook, we've got various summaries, short films, little, um, what do you call it, animations and so on. So there's just some links there. Um, we've got, yeah, Hindi versions of the compass and of the handbook. Um, all the links are there. You're very welcome to have the slides. And I shall stop there and welcome any questions and discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Dwee. It was, I mean, for you, you've finished before time. Thank you so much. It was a very, very engaging uh, presentation. Um, very, I mean, something that we can relate to. Um, you know, India is a country of multitude of differences. We have regional linguistic mm -hmm. caste and uh, class differences, gender, of course. And we are increasingly seeing gender uh, as a non-binary thing. Uh, you know, at least amongst a tiny minority of people engaged in uh, science studies in India. So your presentation is of uh, much value to us. I am sure there are several questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I hope um, they will. They are. They are free to actually feel free to um, turn the mic on and uh, and ask your question, or if you want to. Put it in the chat also, we will read it. There is a long paragraph from Karen. What is the evidence that there is or is not a shortage of scientists? What is the relation between students' interest in science and the future job opportunities? If there is a job shortage, then are schools playing a valuable role in selecting few students for continuing in science and justifying rejection of the majority? If there is a job shortage, is it is obvious in the present world that there will also be a gender, race, class bias. It isn't increasing good jobs the best way to encourage students. Isn't mm -hmm. isn't increasing, yeah, and mm -hmm. the privilege to become scientists. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lot, lots there. I'll try and unpick those in turn. Thank you, Karen. Um, so, is there a shortage of scientists or STEM professionals or not? Um, partly, I think it depends on your view lots and lots of governments and organizations like particularly engineering organizations and professional societies would all argue that there is currently a skills gap and they're projecting an even greater future one so lots of people are very concerned that there is uh, a shortage i think what what when the gap comes in that some analyses that i've read suggest that there's not actually a shortage of stem graduates it's just that we don't then translate all of them into STEM jobs. So there's also an issue, which I haven't drawn on in this presentation, but which we're currently doing some analyses on, of experience, students' experiences of STEM degrees, that they're actually putting them off, continuing with STEM, but particularly among, for example, women and, and so on. So there's partly a mismatch there. Um, so, so we would say that schools, yes, are currently playing a bit of a problematic role. I mean, not just schools, education policy in stopping enough young people. We, we would love more young people to continue, not just for STEM jobs, but also for active citizenship. That's really important, I think, in the modern world. STEM skills are useful for lots of things and for, for agency and social action. I don't think just increasing STEM jobs will solve it. We already are being told that there are these gaps and these, um, you know, shortages in key areas that are really important for the future and, you know, things that are about sol around solving global grand challenges. And we're not getting the flow through. And we know that because these processes are in place, it's actually particularly more likely to stop underprivileged young people from continuing. So our view is that we it won't sort itself out. Um, 
for us, it, pedagogy is not the only thing, but it's one of the things we can do something about. I hope that helps. <laughs> So there are two more questions. Uh, Shweta, Masaya, can you share all the links with participants? Thank you yeah. so much. Yes, I'll, everyone's oh. very welcome to a copy of my slides. So I'll share them. Ayush has a question. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a comment. I'm wondering if your qualitative data also included folks who are transformate, transmac, and so, uh, and if so, I'd be interested in hearing how they were experiencing mm -hmm. the clever, hard masking tip of the yeah. Great question, thank you. Yeah. Yes, so in our qualitative and our quantitative, uh, we've had, uh, we've got a number of, uh, in the quantitative, we've got a number of trans young people. In the qualitative, we only have one. So it was difficult for us to just talk about their experiences um, per se, but I think they did find the, um, the, the, the clever notion of, uh, of STEM, like the other young people, um, a bit exclusionary as well and and difficult to navigate um so it's but i don't i don't want to over claim from just their one experience um but and also not be too identifying with them in our sample uh either but yeah i wish you have a follow-up question okay all right any anyone else any questions you can um turn the mic on and ask So, um, in the meanwhile, I had a question. Uh, so, you, you are, um, your sample actually consisted of, I mean, a huge number of participants, 48,000 young people, that's quite a large number. So, I mean, uh, did you I also ensure that there is a participation, I mean, the, the kind of representation is... Uh, across various social uh, categories? Yes, yeah, so we tried to um, ensure that our sample was roughly uh, representative. I mean, it's quite hard to be, it's never perfectly representative, um, but we did against main um, around gender and race and poverty and, and areas of the country and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, regional, okay. Regional. And so there's a long comment or question here, two of them. Ayush has say something here, there is one, Ashwati has, uh, Ashwati, would you like to ask your question yourself? That would be nice. Comment, if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question. Ashwati? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah. So uh, thank you for the interesting talk. There were, I just had two questions. One was, uh, were you surprised by any of your findings in terms of how they stand in relation to existing empirically supported sociological theories of uh, uh, social reproduction? Mm -hmm. And uh, the second question that I had, do you, need, do you want to answer that and then respond to the second question? Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, so, yeah, I think two things mainly surprised us. So one, I was surprised by how few children, particularly in, at age 10, wanted to be a scientist because they were really loving science. You know, they were so positive. We kind of thought the world is their oyster. I think the statistic that um, statistically there was no change. So some other studies suggest that, you know, there's declining interest over time in science. But I think that surprised us that it was so low, so young, and it was already so patented. It's, um, someone once described our research as deeply depressing, and I, I suspect that's un unfortunately true. Um, and I think the other thing that surprised me was the analysis of social mobility. So a lot of studies have tried to focus on what it is that makes some young people socially mobile and not others, or in our case, intergenerationally educationally mobile. And the thing that surprised me there was the role of luck. So it hasn't been looked at by many other studies. So we've got a paper that's currently um, under review that tries to tease that out and to come up with more of a sociological theorization of luck. Uh, we really were surprised how little had ever been written about that um, before, uh, when actually it seemed really important. So we take a sociological view of luck, of seeing luck as a structural issue in that paper. Um, and we're trying to tease out what it was that was lucky and it was access to social and education, uh, cultural capital. 
Uh, but yeah, that that surprised and slightly also depressed me. <laughs> Okay, you, you wanted lot. to ask the second question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. I mean, I'd really like to read your work on the sociological uh, basis of luck. Uh, the second question that I had was, I was just curious to know that since you were tracking students over 13 years and, uh, and you probably witnessed some of the participants like uh, Vanessa uh, progressively experience exclusion, did you feel the need to intervene or support her in any way? Thanks. It's a, that's a really good question, a good point. It's, it was really difficult. Um, ethically, um, you know, we have to go obviously go through lots of university ethics and we're not meant to intervene. I think we, we ended up as, as um, you know, as individuals sometimes because you, you develop, you know, particularly the, like the people I interviewed, the same people and the same parents and, and young people that I interviewed over time, you, you come to really know and care about them. And it's, you know, so often at the end of the interview, sometimes families would say, oh, can you help, um, you know, in this way or that or point me to some information or something. So we, we would in those cases um, where we were asked as individuals, but also we were quite aware that it's not, we, you know, the interview is confidential. So often, sometimes it's not that um, respondents wanted us to go and solve all their problems for them, but having the space sometimes it almost felt like not not counseling but having the space to be heard felt really important for some of them who were having you know quite difficult experiences so again that was the sort of um i think the, the way we we managed a lot of those relationships as well thanks a lot for sharing that yeah. there, there's one long question from chaitanya he's asking Concerning the message of messaging of cleverness being needed for science or physics, what kind of alternative messaging would you suggest? In other words, if not cleverness, then what should we be telling young people is needed, if anything at all is needed to do science? Also, how could such messaging be operationalized in areas like curriculum or assessment? Because it feels like the present messaging is reinforced by assessment and selection mm -hmm. practice. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So um, when we've shared our work with uh, some of our partners, so like the Institute of Physics, for instance, they have then gone off and looked at their messaging and said, well, actually, we want to work with the teachers they work with to promote the message that, you know, anyone can do science, that it's science as a, as a notion is open for everyone and really work with those teachers to stop them making those little comments that we were hearing from young people like, you know, you need a boy brain to do science, or this is going to be really hard and things like that. So I think on a practical level, there are things that people have started to do with teachers just to help them, you know, just be aware of those little things that they probably weren't even aware of that they were saying. That's teachers at a bigger policy level. We're still arguing that, you know, um, with, with the regulatory um, bodies, along with other um, partners, that actually there should be no grade severity. In, in science because that again really underlines that message that it is different and that you it is harder uh, so it's sort of at different levels that I think um, things can be done but so it's not saying that you don't need high grades if you're going to go and do a physics degree for instance but it is that notion that you don't have to be clever to do physics I think an alternative message of to be good at a subject you work really hard at it I think is a you know valuing hard work is a useful message beyond being naturally brilliant at it and help it working with teachers through professional development to, to see some of those gendered biases there's a, a great study by Heidi Carlone in the states that showed that um, so teachers on an advanced level physics course would describe the boys on the class in the, the group as um, you know that they're naturally brilliant at the subject but a bit lazy and not doing as well whereas the girls who are taking higher they, they're just really hard working and that sort of these sort of gendered ideas of plodding diligence versus natural national natural brilliance so I think there's there's stuff that can be done like that because I agree the assessment practice I think assessment is also too narrow I think there are ways that we can teach science more broadly and assess science more broadly as well that's interesting actually I always wonder whether actually only physics requires cleverness and what about what about uh, you know education? I mean, what about social sciences? I mean, history or sociology or anthropology? I mean, critical thinking. I mean, 
I mean, the very idea of equity uh, is probably extremely difficult for many people to comprehend. Maybe. I, I don't know why cleverness is attributed to only physics or mathematics. I, for us, it's because that's what helps reinforce the high status of the subject. So we often make the argument that if we want to widen participation, we have to look at privilege and power. And we can't keep the status quo, we can't keep notions of status and hierarchy intact and just say, let's broaden it because that's not meaningful. So it's about looking at, you know, why is physics so high status? Partly it's because we construct it as clever, which aligns with white middle class masculinity and so on. So it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, so uh, any more questions? Comments? Deepika? Yeah. While girls in your study talked about physics requiring an effortless cleverness, what were the notions boys held in the corresponding age group? Yeah, so thank you. Good question as well. So, I mean, actually, you know, the, the girls and the boys in the study had similar views <clears throat> of you need to be clever to do physics, but the boys were more likely to say, yeah, I'm good at physics, and the girls were more likely to say, oh, I have to work really hard to do well in physics. So it, it's then how you um, relate yourself to those ideas and what makes it more possible for some students to feel themselves and to be recognized by others as good at, at good at physics. So yes, I would say it was that it's not, it, the boys were not attaining higher, but the issues around masculinity and identity meant that it, and they were getting more encouragement as well from the teachers statistically. They were being encouraged more, so of course they were more likely to feel that they were good at it. Okay, so there's one more question from Zinat. She asks, do you feel that the portrayal of scientists as negative and as antagonists in most movies and comics for children also impact their interest to become Yes, yeah, good question. Thank you. So yes, I think the, I mean, the representations of scientists that we have, they all feed into that, that notion of, you know, where we get these ideas of the effortlessly clever genius scientist from. It's from these films and and so on. I, I mean, I think the issue of whether how negative or not they are, I'm, I'm not, I mean, they're, they're, they're problematic for me, but often there's like the lone genius scientist um, or, uh, you know, when, uh, I, you know, whether the scientist has gone to Mars, uh, I can't remember the name, Matt Damon or someone in the, that film or the, the, the clever genius who comes up with the equation or the sum that solves everything or the you know, it, it's these. It's the alignment of it, but particularly with white masculinity, I think that uh, is is the the you know reinforcing it absolutely there. Adnya asks, can you say why there was difference in girls and boys' response to such questions? I, I would say that's the, the social reproduction of of gender in society. I think that you know we gender our children in in such. Uh, and often in such binary ways and everything's interpreted through that, that we're socialized you know, the, the, into the, these forms of, of gendered habitus. And uh, I, I don't think it's due to any essentialism or natural, I think it's all learned. So like the you know, Victor learns over time. I don't think children are born um, thinking naturally just different things. So Deepika has another question. Did st your study students' tra tra trajectories in other disciplines such as chemistry and biology? Yeah, so, so yeah, in our survey, we followed students, uh, we're tracking whatever their trajectories are. So some of them are in arts, science, uh, you know, social sciences, all different. And um, we haven't done as detailed uh, analyses of all the routes. Um, there's a, a lot of data there to work through. But we are at the moment doing analyses comparing between um, physics, chemistry, biology, maths, computing, and engineering, and medicine as sort of seven main sort of STEM areas to see what it's, so we're finding different patterns in attrition, for example, the likelihood of feeling that you might not complete your degree between those subjects and, and so on. So we're gonna try and do those. And then we also compare those to non, at the moment we're doing analyses compared to non-STEM students to put those in context in that way. But, but yes, they, they have a, a whole range of, lovely and interesting trajectories. I just yeah. need more time so, to do it. <laughs> so I also have this one question. I mean, do you, do you feel that biology, which is becoming a little bit more mathematical these days than before, um, or you no know, physics and physics and mathematics center biology these days than, than before. So has it changed the 
you know, earlier, um, there were more women in biology. Has the, has the number remained the same or has it come down? Do you, do you have any? Yeah, I think pretty much the same. So still high numbers of women in biology and very low numbers of women in engineering and physics uh, as a pattern. Uh, I think what our students were definitely finding interesting is that in school, they had quite fixed ideas of what is biology, what is chemistry, what is physics. When they get to university, they're all saying, oh, hang on, well, I'm doing some coding in this, I'm doing data, you know, there's maths that they could see the interlinking across the different areas more once they get to HE and, you know, um, because they've sometimes, if you're a biologist, you might sometimes be taught by a chemistry, a chemist, if you're doing a bit of biochemistry, but then there are also these practices where people reinforce these disciplinary identities. So saying, but well, of course you're biologists and I'm a chemist. So again, there's identity work going on there that we're going to be interested to try and unpick as well. So uh, if there are a few more questions, I can take a couple of more questions. Otherwise we are, we have, we have finished the time. If there is one kind of urgent question, I can certainly ask. Hello. Otherwise we'll thank, uh, yeah, well, thank you very much. It was a wonderful uh, session. Uh, Luis, hope to see you in India sometime when you come to India. Thank we'll you. get to talk to you much more. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you very much. That'd be wonderful. It's really nice to join you all. Thank you for your questions. Thank you.